Do you ever wish that you could ask a doctor all of your questions? Well, friend, today, my doctor is coming on the Strong Confident, his podcast, and I asked our community of Fit Sisters in Christ all their questions from hormones to metabolic syndrome to what do you think of Ozempic to what do you think of thyroid medicine? Do I have to take it to can I lose weight in perimenopause and menopause, postmenopause? So many questions, ladies. You don't want to miss this episode because he is going to join us and he is going to tackle every one of them. Welcome back to another episode of the Strong Confident His podcast. I wanted to introduce our guest today. He is the kindest doctor I have ever met. I mean, I've shared with you that I went through a lot of hormonal issues, going through perimenopause, menopause, now being postmenopause. Uh, my dad's health issues with, you know, my father passing away from heart disease and Dr. Wozni held my hand and walked me through all the tests, the cardi, you know, getting the cardiac calcium score, which came back as a zero. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, I remember sitting with Dr. Wozni and him basically holding my hand and saying, but what if it comes back as zero Kim and God bless. I'm so grateful. It came back as zero. This man is so kind and so caring, and we are so blessed to have him on the show today. I want to tell you a little bit about his bio. He is a certified and licensed state of Arizona naturopath. At graduation, he received something called the Daphne Bladen Award, and it is given to those for academic excellence, compassion, and perseverance. That is exactly how I would describe him. Prior to medical school, Dr. Wozni graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in, get this, molecular, cellular, developmental biology, and biochemistry from the University of Colorado. He knew he wanted to be a doctor from a very young age and chose to pursue a career in naturopathy because it places an emphasis, and this is why I love him so much, on prevention of disease and optimizing lifestyle to maintain wellness. He focuses on addressing the root causes of disease and partners with his patients to achieve optimal health. In his free time, Dr. Wozni enjoys the outdoors here in sunny Scottsdale on his bike or on the golf course or at the grill with his wife and two daughters. I want to share before I dive in though, friend, our health is our greatest wealth and God desires that for you. So are you on the wait list for the fit God's way? 30 day transformation. Okay. You're going to get the exact roadmap that cost me years of failing on diets, struggling through workouts and beating myself up because I couldn't find results or peace. This 30 day proven step-by-step -step guide for creating Bible belt based fitness and health is going to empower you with worth fix all those unhealthy mindsets and get you results quickly. That is what I want for you, friend. Make sure you're signed up at kimdolanletto.com, fit God's way waitlist. I will include uh, the link in the show notes because you've got to get on this list. Here's the thing. I am a one woman show. Okay. I have a, an assistant who works five hours a week for me, but other than my Delena, who I love so much, I'm doing everything alone. So having the blog, the podcast, the YouTube, the social media, the support, um, my books, devotionals, everything, the shows I'm on, it's a lot. So I don't know how many times I'm going to launch this course or if I ever will again. I, I feel like I want to just walk through this with you and that's why I've created it. And it has been hours of blood, sweat, and tears to put this together for you, creating PDFs for every step creating videos for every step, creating bonuses to serve you, creating a vault of questions and answers and resources, uncovering every single question stone. Like I have done it all for you. So please sign up and be a part of this because honestly, I don't know how many times I'm going to, it's not going to be an open product. It's not evergreen. It's going to be something that I want to hold hands. I want us to link arms together and do together. Okay. And it is going to create a faith inspired transformation. So good. Okay. So let's welcome Dr. Wozni 
to the Strong Confident His podcast. Kim, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Well, I could not believe the response that I got when I reached out to my Fit Sisters in Christ community. I, I said, if you could ask a doctor anything, what would you say? And there was a flood of questions in. I Ooh, sent you the list sure yesterday. Yeah. Dr. Was, and he's like, I'm going to eat my Wheaties and have some extra coffee today so I can <laughs> tackle all these questions. But uh, two things, by the way, I probably wouldn't add to your diet, both Wheaties and coffee. Not <laughs> great for you. <laughs> That's the joke about it is that you would neither have, you would have neither of those. Okay. Right. Well, by the way, when I was reading your bio, I was like, this is an impressive guy. Like oh, I always boy. knew you were smart, but I was like, whoa, you have all the accolades to back it up. And it, it's amazing how smart you are because I was watching the show Royal Pains and they had all these great doctors on, but they had absolutely no way to have, they did not know how to have a relationship with a person. And I'm like, I love that show. That's a great show. Actually. That is literally my favorite <laughs> show right now. I love it. Cause I'm like, I want something that's like got some mystery to it. I love the diagnosis, like the medical aspect of it. Yep. And I love that it's ever changing, but it really made me think of you. Cause I'm like, I have Hank, like Dr. Wozni is like <laughs> Hank on Royal Pains instead of these other guys that are like, you know, I memorized their numbers. Like they don't treat people like people. I feel right. so, I was talking about in the bio, how um, sharing your bio, how I feel so blessed to have you in my life because there are things we face that are scary. So, so let's jump in. Okay. April, yeah. let's, let's kick this off with April. Yeah. Wait, did you have anything you wanted to say? Well, I was just going to, yeah, happy to sort of take all that on. And, and it's, it's one of those kind of uh, different perspectives on sort of the same uh, it, medicine is of course considered generally a science, but also an art. And yes. I think the art aspect of it is often overlooked. There was even one of your listeners who sort of mentioned, you know, something around their hormone levels in their labs, not lining up with the way they feel. And I'll often tell my patients, that's one of the most frustrating things is that mm -hmm. it, if it was just about labs, why are you even talking to the patient? Just take the lab, see what the numbers show and based on those labs, just treat the patient there why spend all the time talking to somebody if you're not even going to listen to them anyway and just focus all your energy on what those labs show. So it's about spending that time and really getting to know someone and say, well, the labs are, or, or at least the science behind it definitely gives you some direction, but boy, what is that patient telling you that, that the labs can't really tell you? And I've sort of always said that, you know, based on my medical decisions, it's about 60% of what you've told me and about 40% what the labs kind of show us or sort of your objective findings in general, right? Those are important, you know, 40% could be pretty important, but at the same time, don't, don't forget what, the, what you've heard from your patients. So um, the art, I think, of actually listening and spending time and getting to know folks, um, unfortunately, I think is being lost these days in, in the general medical world. So and I that was is really what sets by... you apart. Like that's what well, makes no, I don't you hate that way. I think, well, that's so <laughs> sweet of you to say, and, and I've known you a long time here. I think it's one of those um, also just getting to know and, and, and really, really appreciating the people you get to, you get to work with. I've had such a great experience with you over the years and, um, again, Thank so flattered you. to be here with you. Yeah, no, I, I, I shared about how you like held my hand through things and okay. So let's dive in because hormones right, and weight are something that you and I went through. So let's kick this off with April. She said, any advice regarding hormonal health, eating exercise and weight loss for women over 40, because what used to work in the twenties and thirties is not working in the forties. <laughs> what would, what, and yeah. then I, I feel like there's a lot of these questions around this. So maybe we can, um, I, I mean, you have them in front of you. So if you, if there's any that you feel like you can combine, go right ahead. But how would you answer that? Yeah, I would, I, April did a good job in terms of that question, kind of summarizing a lot of things. And frankly, we could spend the whole time just talking about that one question. Right. <laughs> right. And I think we'd probably touch on a lot of other areas too, but um, you know, the forties are really sort of that preparatory, those preparatory years that lead into peri and, and full on menopause. Um, and for, for both men and women, right? So for women, it's considered just uh, general menopause. For men, it's called andropause. Mm -hmm. And um, in both cases, it is the massive change of hormones that signifies that, that sort of coming of age, as they say. And so, it, yes, generally in your 20s and 30s, those are sort of those reproductive years and the body will do everything it can to sort of ensure that happens, right? This is going to sound sort of mm -hmm. cold, but our, our only purpose on this planet is to keep the species going in a way, right? And how do we in a way, keep your body going so you can do that? 
Um, and then as the body senses, like this is a time of our life where it's not happening anymore and I'm going to start transitioning into a different phase, it realizes, well, I, I may need to hold on to more resources. And so what that means is calories that go into the body and normally get burnt pretty quickly, they don't, they get stored away. The body's sort of thinking like, well, I'll save these up for a rainy day in that I might need them at some other, at some other phase. It's also that those hormones, you know, particularly estrogen and progesterone and testosterone help sort of the, they're the crucible in which a lot of those calories sort of burn. So as you're learning, losing those, losing those, those hormones, then you basically don't have any way to, to, to burn those extra calories. So in a way, then that's where I'll often recommend uh, the types of calories that you're eating, being careful with you know, simple carbohydrates and things that, you know, spike blood sugar very quickly and drop it very quickly. Um, and, and of course, then there's this sort of newer concept around intermittent fasting, sort of the time of the day that you do eat. And that actually sort of does play into the circadian rhythm, which is driven by cortisol. And that's, of course, a hormone that does connect with estrogen and progesterone and all those things too. So mm -hmm. um, it's this sort of complicated spaghetti soup, uh, low carb, you know, no, no uh, gluten spaghetti soup. But uh, the idea that those kind of um, hormones can drive the stress response and also have something to do with um, you know, how all those hormones sort of play together, basically. So that leads us to Wendy, who said, what, what kind, what can a woman do who's in menopause? Like how, what can we do to help with that transition? Yeah. And I will say in my number of years, you know, almost 18 years of practice here, that varies a lot. So for some women, it can be quite disruptive in that miserable hot flashes and night sweats and, I can't remember names anymore. And I used to have a, a brain like a steel trap and I, I feel like I'm going crazy and I'm losing and obviously very disruptive to, to your to lifestyle and just um, being able to complete your sort of daily responsibilities to the sort of the other end of the spectrum where I kind of sort of breeze through this wasn't too bad at all and seemed to be fine. So at its extreme, you know, when things are so disruptive to life, you may need to use hormone replacement. But there are safer ways of doing that. Uh, the sort of old fashioned way was using oral hormone replacement. So this is Premarin. And um, Premarin is actually, this is where the name comes from. It comes from pregnant horse urine. So pregnant oh mare gosh. urine, Premarin, that's where it's from. And those are conjugated estrogen. So basically a type of estrogen that we collect from horses and package them into pills and then we swallow them, um, which again, uh, as we've learned, is the sort of un, most unsafe way to take hormones. So this was based on a sort of early study in the early 2000s. And now as the years have gone on, we've learned that if you're basically taking these hormones in different ways, and if they're plant-based, bioidentical, different forms of hormones um, driven through the skin, usually as the form of creams or patches or um, injections or gels, those kind of things, much safer than taking a hormone and swallowing it. This is also why birth control pills as an oral pill is not good for us. That has to pass through the liver and basically gets very irritated as it passes through the liver and then ultimately causes a fair amount of other downstream problems, blood clot and stroke and potential cancers and really big problems. So the point is, if things are really extreme, you may need to get some hormones back on board to kind of help smooth that transition. But there are better choices in the world out there than just synthetic or conjugated hormones, these sort of bioidentical, more plant-based or sort of speak more natural versions of hormones, uh, sort of nudge a little less medicine there. There are supplements that kind of help. There are herbs that are generally around that black blue cohosh. Sometimes even DHEA can be helpful, which is a small hormone, but it's a supplement you can get over the counter. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's as simple, and this is going to seem kind of weird as getting folks going to the bathroom more regularly. What does that have to do with it? Well, it turns out that it's the sort of the retention of these hormones and their metabolites specifically. And in other words, if you don't eliminate them from the body, they can cause some problems as well. So I've actually oh, had wow. a lot of folks who've had constipation issues and you sort of help clean up their gut and get them moving their bowels better. And they have a significant improvement in their symptoms, which seems very silly. I just tell them to eat more fiber, try and target around 30 grams a day if you can. Mm -hmm. There's a great book out there called The Full Plate Diet. 
that helps mm-hmm. folks. Uh, it's, it's online, it's free, and it's a great way to sort of get folks targeted towards that 30 grams. Most people are eating less than 10 a day, um, oh both soluble and soluble fiber. So again, I know I'm throwing a lot at you here, but the idea that it's a good question and every good question has a complicated answer, but in terms of sort of making that transition through peri and postmenopause as smooth as possible, it sometimes might require hormone support or hormone replacement, but sometimes it just requires a little bit of sort of nudging the body in the right direction and making sure the natural systems of our body are, are working as best as they can. Okay. That's really helpful. I, I just want to share that you really helped me because I, I remember coming in and you were like, you don't even have a whiff of estrogen. Like I had <laughs> zero estrogen zero progesterone, but my body was making testosterone. And you're like, well, no wonder you're not sleeping (laughs) and just giving me a little bit of progesterone so that I could sleep for just a short amount of time was so helpful. And I want to encourage women to know that I didn't know this until I knew you, that your body is supposed to go through this transition and it isn't the whole book. It's just a chapter in the story. And that it is a transition that your body's meant to do. You're meant to have all those reproductive hormones as a younger woman. But then as you age, you're the good news is, is you're not going to have a period anymore and all the crazy PMS and all of that, but your body's going to go through this up and down one day. You're going to feel good. One day you're not, you're not going to be able to sleep. It's, it's a transition and it it's going to end. It's going, you're going to get through it. So <laughs> It'll be okay. you have, yes. So I will say that it was hard for me to make that decision, but getting on that progesterone at night enabled me to sleep, which drove down the cortisol that I was having. Cause like, I feel like the stress of not sleeping. And I just want to encourage women. If you're, if you're in that struggle, talk to a naturopathic doctor, like Dr. Wozni, because it will make all the difference in your life than going somewhere where they just put you on patches and they're not listening to you and testing your blood. He would look at my blood. He would talk to me and listen to me. And then we would make decisions from that. And it is life altering in the quality of your life to have that combination of service from someone like this amazing gentleman on our show today. Okay. Oh my so gosh. Wow. says, Thanks. I got to talk to you daily. You're just my hype gal. Get me going. This is awesome. <laughs> I'm your hype girl. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, this is a good question. Lazelda says, can you have menopause symptoms, even though your blood work is in normal range? See, this is exactly, I, I forgot who wrote that question. That's exactly it right there. It's a yeah. brilliant question where this, the short answer is yes, of course. Mm-hmm. And, and the trouble I will say, there are some limitations when it comes to testing hormones. It depends when you test, right? There is a cycle to Mm -hmm. women's hormones and it changes all month long. So depending if you check it at one point of the cycle at one time of the year, and then you check again to sort of have a comparative value. If you're checking it another time of the year, you've now got apples and oranges. You really can't compare the two of them. So I will say it is important if you can to try to be consistent there. In our clinic, we try to test gals between days 18 and 20 or so, and that kind of goes back to what you were talking about with the progesterone side of things. Um, it's also when estrogen tends to come down following ovulation a little bit. Um, so all that to say, this again is where that relationship and that communication network between you and your provider is so important. And understanding that that might not always line up with what your labs are showing you, but spending a good amount of time trying to understand, you know, what clinically is going on for the patient. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was great. So Casey says, what is the easiest way to check if hormones are affecting weight gain and easiest natural way to lose weight? If it is a hormonal issue, are there certain foods or exercises we should avoid during cortisol? And I feel like I could answer this question because I have worked with you and I have lived 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 it. it. All right. Well, let's, let's test you. Let's see. What have you, what have you learned from that? What maybe worked well for you? Um, honestly, Well, for me, I feel like as you age, the workouts that you used to do all the high intensity training and the extreme training is not your friend when you have a very unstable hormone profile and you're, you're going through that transition because when you stress your body out and you're already not sleeping and you're raising your cortisol you are in an ugly mess of anxiety. So you're unable to rest and rest is really where our body repairs itself. And that's when we lose weight. That's where we get the muscle gains. That's where we do all the healing. It's not in the training so much. So I've learned to trade in my high intensity interval training for walking 
and weight training and body weight training and Pilates. I actually just started doing Pilates more because I want to be extremely joint friendly to my body, but I will Good say thinking. never, I, I will say the word easiest was written in the sentence twice and there is no easy way. It's you've really got to, and I teach everything through the word of God. So it's just getting prayerful and real with yourself and listening, mm -hmm. really asking God to help you point out like, what are the foods that are driving up my cravings that are making me, am I drinking too much caffeine? Am I eating sugar? Like, where am I not having the highest quality nutrition? Because never is it more important than when you go through this transition, sugar, alcohol, the, like all of those things that you used to get away with, uh, you don't even want them anymore because they are not worth sleep. Like it's literally trading your mental acuity, your sleep a poor diet and a lack of exercise and no sleep is that you don't have to live like that. So I don't feel like it's an easy way. I feel like you have to step up to the plate more than ever and ba do battle for your health. You, every choice matters during this transition. You nailed it. I wish, I, I wish there was an easy answer and it, it could be as simple as, and, and of course, every few years, something new comes out, take this new mm -hmm. supplement that we found in the deep jungles of Africa or the Amazon. And this right. is going to magically balance all of your hormones. And I, again, yeah, I wish it was that simple, but you've nailed it. And I, I think people often ask if there's something, if, if there's one thing I could do in my life that would make a big improvement in my health, what would it be? And the best answer is to limit as much as possible sim simple sugars in the diet. That mm -hmm. moves the needle more. Well, actually the, the number one thing is smoking. If you're a smoker, stop smoking. That moves the needle in so many ways, like in so many bad ways. Um, and I would think hopefully by 2024, we'd all, everybody knows smoking is not good for you. So it's mm -hmm. for those who do smoke, it's not about telling them to stop smoking. It's like, why are you smoking? And how do we figure out other, other stress uh, reduction techniques for you? And, um, but if, if assuming that's in a, a good place, simple sugar by no stretch of the imagination it moves the needle more than really anything else. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it's so pro-inflammatory. It's so inhibitory to your immune system. So it actually, it's also part of, I think, not a coincidence that during the cold and flu season happens to be during the holiday season when people mm -hmm. tend to enjoy more of those sort of simple sugars. So mm -hmm. um, if you could limit, uh, and again, it's very challenging and I think unrealistic to tell people to eliminate, which means zero. I think life's about enjoying some things too, but it's not about excess. Uh, but at the same time, I think if people are trying to make a, a, a big impact and only have enough either focus or attention span to do one thing, it would be to try to limit simple carbohydrates, simple sugars in the diet where possible. Okay. So before we leave this, I just want to make sure we answer this part of her question. The easiest way to check hormones, if hormones are affecting weight gain, that would be through blood, right? Through testing. Yeah. And, and again, sort of then interpreting where you are in your cycle, if you're having a cycle or not. And, and if you're not, then sort of going back and understanding, you know, what did happen when you were having periods and mm -hmm. what were your pregnancies like if you were pregnant and um, recovery from pregnancies. And, and those are all clues that give you insight into what's going on around hormones and how your body really responds to hormones. And, okay. I, I, and unfortunately, again, that's what makes it not such an easy question to answer. Cause of course, everybody responds differently. And so again, progesterone, we'll just use a quick example and I don't want to break confidentiality within your medical information, but you brought it up. And the idea that progesterone is so good for sleep. Well, it's an anti-inflammatory hormone. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just put everybody on, on progesterone? It's such a gentle, simple thing, helps everybody sleep. Well, too much of it can cause mood changes. It can cause water retention. It can cause, which of course could lead to weight gain. Everybody hates that. So it's not that everything works for everyone. It's about really trying to find that combination. And um, of course, the amount of those combinations that work best for each person. So yeah. again, I know we're all looking for a simple soundbite and simple answer, but it's, it's, it's particularly when it comes to hormones, it's unfortunately not that easy. You're right. Cause they're ever changing. And I remember you said you're on the lowest dose of progesterone. Cause you know, my first question was, I don't want to yep. gain weight. It's like, <laughs> I am not. Nobody does. Weight. I get it. Yeah. So sure. I'm like, I'm doing everything right. Like, ugh. so I will say that, I mean, and it was just for a short window. Like the, it, I felt, I think we need to understand this is like 
something, it's going to change. It's ever changing. You're not, if you're in the thick of things right now, it's not going to stay this way. Totally. There, it it totally. will like now I'm like, woo, I don't miss my period. I, I don't it. miss PMS. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I did it. But it also comes like it, you know, I see now my, what I eat and how I work out and how important strength training and consistent cardio is and all of the things. So that's uh, Carrie asks, can you lose body fat and gain muscle when you are postmenopausal? It's challenging. Uh, it, it's those hormones are really important for a multitude of reasons. One, we'll kind of, we were talking about progesterone a second ago. Let's spend a second talking about estrogen and estrogen is sort of a umbrella term for the different types of estrogen in your body. There are three main forms of estrogen, estrone, estradiol, and estriol. And they all have their different functions. Most of the biological activity is with estradiol. And if you look at most hormone replacement regimens, they in include mostly estradiol. And that's what kind of helps move the needle. In most cases, that's where most of the studies have been done as well. And we have found that that significantly increases bone density and prevents osteopenia and osteoporosis, right? Two major issues that we know uh, significantly increase after uh, menopause. But that also goes along with the muscles that are associated with those bones. Mm -hmm. So as bones over those muscles start to atrophy as we age, the bones underneath them can also atrophy or thin and become osteopenic or osteoporotic. So the point is, it's much more challenging to maintain that muscle density, that muscle mass as you lose those hormones. But it's also the same reason where exercise is so important. There's actually some pretty interesting studies from the late 90s um, and one that they called the flamingo study. So they actually had gals stand on one leg, kind of bracing themselves to not fall over, but stood on one leg. And I think it was for 90 seconds at a time on each leg. And they found that bone density in the hip increased by a significant, I think 30, almost 40%. So it wow. didn't take much, but just in other words, working on balance. And this is where I love yoga and Pilates and sort of low impact types of exercises, because though even those kind of exercises can help with muscle mass and bone density and those uh, sort of things that are important through menopause. Um, where again, it becomes challenging was that word that was thrown in there, which is fat, right? And everybody mm -hmm. always is worried about that, you know, fat deposition in the central uh, abdomen area, backside, thighs. And that is driven by a lot of hormones as well in sort of a negative way. Sometimes if you're estrogen dominant, too much estrogen in the body can drive some of those, that fat uh, deposition throughout the body. So um, again, that's where in addition to that, and again, not to try to get things too complicated, it also plays into the stress response that we've all heard about how cortisol as a stress hormone can lead to additional weight gain. And again, sort of the same idea, menopause can be quite a stressful thing. And so as you're going through that process, and if your sleep is disrupted due to hot flashes or night sweats, or for other reasons mm -hmm. too, that compounds the problem. Um, so again, I'm, I know I'm sort of circling around the answer to the question here, but it does, to simply try to answer it, it does show, or these hormones play a bigger role into it than I think they're given a lot of credit to. And what you shouldn't overlook though, is how your general lifestyle can play into that. And I think as women transition through that process and don't need those hormones as much anymore, um, it makes all those lifestyle choices that much more important. Yes. And I don't want to leave this without saying we, if I learned this correctly, um, to correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Wozni, we don't make estrogen or progesterone anymore once we've gone through menopause, but we can still make testosterone. So if you lift weights and if you want energy in life, I mean, I feel like lifting weight strength training for me feels more important than it ever has, because I feel like that's, I, I'm not saying by any means that I have like the midsection that I had when I was the leanest, I was competing in fitness because that was ridiculous. But I do know that trying to control my stress and weight training and keeping my steps up every day, because I I've just walking has become like my thing. Like I walk with Jesus. Like, I'm like, I'm going to go walk, listen to the Bible or whatever. It just literally has been so good for calming Wonderful. me down. Cause I'm very yeah, like, I have so much energy. Dr. Wozni knows this about me. Um, but the testosterone, knowing when you told me you can, you can change that one. 
like with weight exactly. training. That made me feel like, yes. ooh, because I'm like, I want to do whatever I can. And the fact that if I lift weights, that's going to increase my testosterone, which is going to help my bone density, keep me leaner, enable me to eat more calories. I was like, this is, this is my win. So that's that, a simple that way to think about it. That's yeah. a great, that's a great way to put it. And it comes back to the general concept that of course, when you pick something heavy up, the body goes, whoa, that was heavy. Okay. Why don't we squirt out some more testosterone? And it, mm -hmm. after menopause, it'll be from the adrenal glands and not so much from the ovaries anymore, but it can do that. And the body will then build the muscles around it and go, okay, hopefully next time when we pick that heavy thing up, it won't be as heavy. And so then mm -hmm. that builds the muscles and same idea. So then if you continue doing that, then it maintains that muscle mass. And, and of course, mm -hmm. like we're saying too, the bones that are underneath them and keeping them nice and strong and dense as well. I'm always looking for a way. Okay. Let's switch yeah. gears. Okay. No, Thank you it. for that. <laughs> okay. No, so course, great. Natalia asks, what are natural ways for better sleep? Yeah. So we've all heard of sleep hygiene and I think it, it often gets overlooked that, um, things you don't think play into it, you know, whether it's enjoying a TV show, checking that last email before you go to bed. We mm -hmm. do know that these screens, and of course you and I are staring at one right now, mm -hmm. uh, you are, are flick, have a flicker rate sort of associated with them. Uh, right. It's, it's a, I, I think if I recall, it's around 60 Hertz or so. Um, and what that basically means is it's stimulating our brain to be able to, to take in the information, right? The visuals that sort of come through it. The problem wow. is it, Wait, it that's what it massive. does. What you just said is massive. Like I'm thinking about my blue light glasses, but like what you just <laughs> said, I mean, that's huge. I don't think people know that. Well, and the science behind that says what it's doing is it's stimulating a part of your brain to wake up. So if we think back to when we didn't really have artificial electricity, artificial light, right? The, the ability yeah. that we can wake up very early when the sun's not up or stay up late when the sun's not up. But mm -hmm. our bodies haven't really evolved around that. It's sort of is sensing like, well, I guess it's still daytime. It's time to be awake. So we often overlook how impactful those little things can be around our sleep. And it's, it's not very sexy, but to say, you know, you really shouldn't be looking at screens a couple hours before you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, you know, I, I feel like I get drowsy and I, I'm, I, I like the idea of watching something with my with my spouse and or whatever to, to sort of kind of wind down. Um, but there is data that shows that it upregulates excitatory brain activity, thinking that it is still light outside and still time to be alert. So step okay. one is to try to try to limit as much light as possible, um, particularly to your eyes. Some interesting studies actually found though too that there are receptors throughout your body that can also, they did these studies on the backs of people's knees as it turns out sort of a thin skin part of your body. And they shone light through the backs of these people's knees and the light actually sort of activated some of these, these wake up types of hormones. And the idea I think is that there are photoreceptors, basically light receptors in your blood, in your blood cells that can sort of tell you that it's time to wake up or time to sort of, again, be alert. Um, so again, not to say you have to like go hide in the cave and be completely blackout shades and, and, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. But trying to limit those obvious sources of, of excitatory sort of information. Again, the light more than anything else too. So that's, a, that's kind of one good place to start. We do know that temperature plays into that as well. Most people tend to sleep better in sort of a cooler room versus sort of a warmer room. Of course, this is why hot flashes, not to go back to the hormone thing for a minute, but during menopause, why hot flashes mm -hmm. are so miserable um because then you get super hot and the covers come off now you're sweating cold okay that covers back on and this yeah. is all night long thing <laughs> um but making sure that the room you're sleeping in temperature wise can also probably be, be quite helpful and then for other people it's there's a ritual sort of with it and sometimes that means reading a book with actually book with paper and you know not a kindle or an ipad or something again that has a screen associated with it uh kindles are a little better but still um, not quite the same thing as just a standard old paper book, um, mm -hmm. in a way that actually kind of can be calming. There are different light bulbs that are out there kind of going with that light theory, the sort of opposite effect, kind of calmer frequencies that can be relaxing for the body too. I've actually experimented a little bit with those and sort of hit or miss, but seems like it's not, not going to make anything worse. Um, and then of course you can kind of then slowly move into, um, ways that you can artificially help sleep. And I'll, I'll get on my soapbox for one second around melatonin. 
because okay. melatonin is really popular and everybody loves melatonin yeah. and your brain, it's a hormone. Your brain makes melatonin. And what scares me is that there are dosages of melatonin out there at 10, 15, 20 milligrams, these really high amounts of melatonin. And most of the literature says we make about six milligrams of melatonin uh, throughout the course of a 24 hour period when, when we need to sleep. So the idea is if you take anything more than that, you're going to stop your body's own melatonin production. And then you become dependent on this artificial source of melatonin from a pill. So I'm really nervous when people, you know, I'm taking melatonin. Okay. How much? Oh, just 10 or 15 milligrams. Like, oh shoot. Okay. We got to get you off of that or start tapering off of that. And how long have you been doing that? And so melatonin can be a great tool for short periods of time at lower doses, making sure that you're below that six milligrams. And again, most of the time, one to three is kind of the general recommendations just be, and again, not for, for, for too long. So, because what happens then of course, is you're creating sort of a dependency. People mm -hmm. use the word addiction and it's, it's not quite the, quite the mm -hmm. right term, but you create this dependency of like, well, now every night I have to take a melatonin in order to sleep. And that's right. not, that's not great for you either. So I think if you're getting all those other sort of sleep hygiene mm -hmm. steps sort of in place and still struggle a little bit, life throws curveballs at it. Sometimes you just mm -hmm. can't um, get everything in place as best as possible. Um, and so if you need a little help, that's where something like melatonin can be an okay option or even sleepy time tea or those kind of gentle herbal preparations yes. can be great too. I was going to ask you, sleepy time tea has valerian root in it. So what are your thoughts about valerian versus melatonin? Yeah. So the, uh, valerian is an herb versus a hormone like melatonin is. So uh, yeah. So anything along those kind of lines is, it's, and it's, valerian is a, a great example. Um, and anything sort of more botanical or herbal in nature is much gentler. The question though is, is it so gentle that it's uh, not very effective? right? That's the balance, right? We could stick mm -hmm. people on Ambien or Xanax or whatever to try to sleep and, oh yeah, you'll get them to sleep but because it, it's so aggressive, but now you've created all these sort of side effects. So mm -hmm. melatonin is kind of the same thing. Like it's, it's a little more aggressive and you got to be careful because you don't want to take too much of it. So then we moved out, you know, something like sleepy time tea um, or phosphatidylserine or, you know, there's lots of other sort of gentle herbal things that are good at calming people down but is it strong enough that you can actually get them to sleep? And that's sort of the, the dilemma, you know, that's the balance yeah. that you're trying to strike. I really like the idea. I teach people to create morning and evening routines and having an evening routine where uh, you intentionally pray and give your stress to God and maybe have a scripture that you hold on to. Cause there's a scripture in the Bible that says like your sleep will be sweet. And mm -hmm. I remember just thinking like, Lord, I am going to hold on to that through menopause. Love it. <laughs> That's it great. sure didn't feel like it, but eventually it, it was. So I think that, um, priming, it's just like a morning routine, you know, people will, they, ha they get up, they do X, Y, Z. So what we don't want to do is like, try to use things to make us tired. And then in the morning we're like, okay, now I need this to go this way. So totally, you want to be totally. careful with your circadian rhythm to, um, you know, get out in the sun, like vitamin D, like being out in the sun, I think is the best thing for sleep. I, I mean, for me personally, making sure that that time at, you know, four o'clock when I'm tired, I'm not turning to sugar, I'm not turning to caffeine. I don't drink caffeine sure. after noon. Um, yep. I get out in the sun. So my body knows, okay, it's still daytime. Like I want to make sure that I'm doing that. Um, that that's really helped me. So I just wanted to chime in and share that. So do you I have anything it. else you want to add before we jump into cholesterol? It's really, no, those are all great, but those are all good points. And it, it, it's this dilemma, you know, particularly again, with the sort of art and practice of medicine, which mm -hmm. is all that sort of, again, not to repeat myself, but sort of non-sexy stuff that it's yeah. so important to have that foundation. Well, mm -hmm. can't I just take a little supplement or take something? Well, yeah, but that's, that's not the found, that's not the most important part of this. And no. again, we go back to sort of standard medicine too. make sure patients are eating well and sleeping and are, are they getting their breath going? They'll you know, get rid of the yeah. carbon dioxide. They don't need anyway. Well, how do you do that? Right. Well, it's exercise. Like, yeah, again, it's, it's not really, um, uh, there's really no way to, to like short cut the lifestyle. Like the lifestyle is, uh, so important. And 
and you know that I'm all for that. So that's why you're the perfect doctor for sure for me. But I do think it is hard because people don't realize, well, I want to just take this. Yeah. But then you're, what about your liver and kidneys and your own melatonin production and your own, like you want to be, that should be the last resort, not the first line of defense. I and this may be a good segue into your next question around cholesterol, actually, because, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the number one prescribed drug in the United States is actually a statin, right? A mm-hmm. drug that helps lower cholesterol. And it works like a charm. It's magic. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And it lowers cholesterol. How easy is that? That's so nice. Like, great. Wait a minute. Why is the cholesterol elevated in the first place? And how... How did you get to that point? What should mm-hmm. we be doing about your lifestyle to prevent it? And by the way, it has very little to do with your diet, uh, only about 20% and has a lot to do with um, balancing kind of everything else, making sure right. that your sleep is in good, a in good place, that your digestion is working properly. And it actually plays in the hormones. Turns out that cholesterol mm-hmm. synthesis is required for testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen production and cortisol. So of course, with just the stress hormone, so it's often overlooked that, oh, as people start going through menopause and andropause, their cholesterol starts going up. Okay, now it's time for your Lipitor or statin that we're going to stick mm-hmm. you on. Well, it's like, wait a minute, my hormones are, or my cholesterol is going up because my hormones are going down. How about if I get my hormones working better and my body, then cholesterol, come, and I've seen it hundreds of times and patients mm-hmm. don't need statins. So uh, I forgot that question. Actually, I don't have it handy with me here, but uh Maybe, again, kind of blending into that, but the ultimate underlying theme, I think, is don't overlook, if you can, trying to address the cause. And in doing so, the downstream consequence or downstream problem that you're sort of dealing with will generally fix itself. And then you don't need to take melatonin or Lipitor right. or red yeast rice or, or some other symptom addressing agent. Right. I think what you just shared is so valuable because I don't think a lot of people realize when you're going through that hormonal transition that your cortisol can go up and they, they start thinking, oh my gosh, I went to the doctor. They said I had high cholesterol and my dad had high cholesterol and my mom had high cholesterol and I'm going to die. And like, then the cortisol is just like, you know, it's like the ugliest anxiety ridden <laughs> thing. Um, okay. So Wendy says, how dangerous is it not to go on cholesterol lowering medication and what is proven to naturally lower cholesterol? Yeah. So there we go. Right. That's, if I remember that was the question that, um, so specifically, obviously you need to talk to your doctor about this, that there are some people with familial, familial hypercholesterolemia that Mm -hmm. in other words, genetically, it's really hard to kind of get around that problem. And unfortunately, and thank goodness we have those medicines like statins to help those folks, Mm -hmm. but a vast majority of people really don't need them per se again, if you can really ultimately get to the cause and figure out why cholesterol levels are so high. And again, unfortunately, it's not a simple, direct way to do that. But if you can find all those little avenues that may be creating levels of or higher levels of those cholesterol markers, um, you may not need medication. But uh, one you know, very popular, and I mentioned it real quickly a second ago, uh, one popular over-the-counter remedy that's often used is red yeast rice. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a supplement that's often also combined with something called CoQ10 or CoQ enzyme 10. Um, And the two of them together have actually been shown to be very effective at lowering cholesterol. But again, I'm always hesitant to say, just take that kind of stuff without really spending any time trying to understand, you know, why that cholesterol level is somewhat elevated Um, and how elevated, you know, is it going to be effective enough to actually make a difference uh, for that patient. Cause of course the ultimate goal is to prevent heart disease, um, in its various forms, you know, whether it's, um, a blockage in the arteries of the heart uh, within the peripheral vascular system itself. And, and does cholesterol play into that? Yes. But so does inflammation and so does, uh, mm-hmm. obesity. And so does, w- uh, loss of muscle mass. And then again, many other factors, um, not just as simple as, as high cholesterol, which kind of makes sense. You know, if you look over the years, the number of people who've taken lipids, lipid lowering medications, statins, again, it's the number one prescribed drug. And we and heart disease is still the number one problem in the United States for both men and women. So the answer isn't just sticking everybody on a, on a lower cholesterol lowering medicine. Um, unfortunately, it's it's quite a bit more complicated than that. Right. They need a doctor like you. Okay, so Sheila says, no, <laughs> so will certain medications bring up cholesterol? Are there any medications that elevate your cholesterol? That increase your cholesterol. 
Uh, gosh, that's a good question. I did not see that. I don't. I don't know that I actually. Don't, I, don't I don't think either. so. I've never. I've never seen that. I, yeah. I, I don't think that's possible. I, I would argue. Or I've seen that certain birth controls can have an effect on cholesterol. It usually lowers mm -hmm. it a little bit. Um, again, sort of for the same reason that hormones, again, being effective right. birth control, can have an effect there. Um, but not raising cholesterol. Okay. There was a study that actually just came out today, breaking news around niacin, which is mm -hmm. vitamin B3. Mm -hmm. That was a, sort of an old fashioned way that we would use that, uh, that would lower cholesterol. So before statins really invented, uh, patients would be put on sort of higher doses of niacin. Uh, the problem is it had a, it has a flushing effect. You get this real redness to you and mm -hmm. you get really hot. It's pretty uncomfortable for most people. Um, and it, to be, at the doses you usually have to prescribe to get the effect you're looking for. Uh, but anyway, that kind of came out today and said that's probably not really good for a lot of people, those high doses of niacin, and sort of need to be a little careful with that um, okay. for other reasons, could lead to some other problems. So point is, again, red yeast rice can help lower cholesterol, CoQ10 is helpful, niacin has been shown to do that, maybe need to be a little careful with niacin these days. Okay. All right. So let's switch gears. Amanda shares, I'm 35 and I was three, 300 pounds for a decade. High triglycerides were very common for me. I worried about heart health other than blood work. Are there any tests I can ask to check my heart plaque buildup to see if I've caused too much damage over the years? Good question. So short of getting with a cardiologist, of course, where they have all their interventions and lots of technology, angiograms, echocardiograms, ways to look at the heart with a lot of intervention. Um, there's a somewhat newer test called a coronary artery score or a calcium artery score. Um, and this can be done at a regular place where they just do x-rays and CTs, that kind of thing. But basically what it does is it takes an x-ray of your heart um, I did it about five years ago or so just to see what it was like. It took about a minute and a half. It didn't hurt. There was no uh, dye that they had to inject. You basically just had to put a gallon on and you move back and forth and up and down a little bit in the machine and it then gives you a score and it's kind of like a reverse credit score. So basically it gives you, you could be as low as a zero, which is what I got. It was great. Got zero, which means no plaque, no hard plaque. We'll talk about the difference here in a second. And then all the way to sometimes it can be in the thousands for certain patients and then anywhere in between. And then based on that number, it kind of stratifies your risk, tells you, you know, how dangerous it potentially is. So in basically less than two minutes, you can get a pretty good indicator of what kind of hard plaque potential you have in the heart. And then that combined with, again, soft plaque, which then plays into a little bit of that cholesterol, inflammation, all those other sort of little markers um, together can kind of help you determine your risk for, for potential heart disease. I will say too, and I'll try not to get too much into the weeds here, but there are some newer tests that the Cleveland Clinic, which is considered you know, our heart hospital, um, that they are now starting to send around the country that are other blood tests and other ways to look at heart health and particularly the arteries around the heart. And if there are any signs of that soft plaque, um, there are real technical terms and it wouldn't make a lot of sense to folks right now, but they are um, real easy. It's a blood test with a little bit of urine too. Oddly enough, there's one enzyme that we can collect in the urine and that can give us another picture of what the soft plaque uh, picture sort of looks like in the heart. Is that the cardiac IQ test we took? That's that's right. That's what it's called. Yeah, I, cardiac, did, yeah. I was sharing that you held my hand through that as well as the, you know, with my dad dying. My, I mean, Dr. Wozni, my dad at 47 had a stroke and then a quadruple bypass and then he needed a kidney and my brother gave him one and he had a heart attack on the table and died and they brought him back. Mm -hmm. Then he ended up dying from a massive heart attack. And this mm -hmm. was a man who wasn't overweight. I mean, he smoked all his life. Um, <laughs> Again, that's I, the I, one thing I, you got to like, get, get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Like I just, I, I, the, the thought of all of that terrified me. And I came to your office and you said, let's do this cardiac IQ. Let's do the uh, coronary, the cardiac, uh, calcium score. And you said, you looked at me and you said, but what if it's zero? Like, what if the score is zero? Like, I didn't know what it was going to be for me. And it was zero. And, yeah. um, I thank you so much for doing that because now that I have, I got that zero. I'm like, I've never wanted a zero so bad in my life. And then the <laughs> cardiac totally. IQ came back that I had very low inflammation and you were very happy with that. And I'm only sharing that because it's scary taking these tests. And as we age sure. and 
I want people to know that just because you explained it to me like this, just because your dad was your dad doesn't mean that like you're going to be your dad. It's like you had a gun and you, you dismantled the gun. You took the bullets out of it. You put it in a safe and you took it to a safety deposit box and locked it up. Like <laughs> you're doing everything you can not to be him. But I feel like so many of us just think, oh, well, my whole family's this, so I'm going to be this. And I want to take a stand today and say, that's not true. And stop telling yourself that because there are things you can start doing right now that will make you the person who changed that directive in your family. It doesn't have to be that way. Agreed. And I will say too, doing these tests with all of my patients, um, I, I can proudly say over the years, I think we have saved a number of lives. And to the point of, of the question from one of your listeners is, if nothing else, it gives you information around it, right? Mm -hmm. you, if, if ideally we have, everything's clear, then great. We don't need to waste any energy worrying about this. It's not, a, it's not your issue to worry about. But if we do the test and find that there's a problem, then all right, well, we've, we've identified it. Great. Now let's make some big changes. And, and again, that's different for everyone. But the first step is to try to gather that information and help you determine how severe it really is. And then that gives you some direction of where to go with it. Yeah. It really helped me not like I was very ang anxious about it. Okay. So let's switch gears real quick. Lily says, is there a natural substitute for thyroid medication? Yeah. That, I, I saw that question too. There's so the most common medication out there is called Synthroid or level thyroxine. Mm -hmm. And it's the vast majority of folks who have thyroid issues are on that medication. And there's some interesting history behind that. And we could again, spend a whole, a whole, uh, podcast talking about that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's one type of hormone uh, that your thyroid makes called thyroxine or T4. So you may have seen that in some of your testing. If you've ever had your thyroid test, they'll measure T4 and sometimes you mm -hmm. see T3 in there and they'll call it free T3 or total T4. And it can be really confusing. Um, but basically, and I'll again, try to keep it simple, even uh, you know, as complicated as it can get, but this goes back to my biochemistry day. So I get excited about this stuff and people <laughs> kind of get nerded out with me a little bit. But at the end of the day, what happens is the T4, the four stands for the number of iodide molecules in the molecule. So if you remember, they have iodized salt. You probably remember mm -hmm. hearing about that. And this is kind of an interesting story of sort of public health. And there was a big problem with goiters and, um, big issues with thyroid and they started adding iodine to the salt and magically, but not magically, things got dramatically better for people. So iodine is incredibly important for our bodies. It turns out though, you have to be careful. You don't want to overdo it. There's people who supplement with extra iodine thinking it's helping their thyroids mm -hmm. and or thyroid production. But what it's unfortunately doing, if you overdo it, is it actually sort of slows things down and, and actually could lead to thyroid cancer. So it's really important oh, to not take more than 250 micrograms a day, So, which is a very small amount. There's people taking milligrams and milligrams. So anyway, that's a side note. But the point is the Synthroid or uh, Levothyroxine that you're taking is T4. It's just the four iodines that are in there. It turns out that that doesn't really do much for us. It's either created in the thyroid gland or comes from your medicine and then it goes around the body and when it gets to where it needs to go um, and this actually happens in the liver too but the body will take one of those iodines off and it makes t3 then and it's the t3 that's kind of the jet fuel that's what actually helps bring energy up and moves your metabolism and bowels and all the things that thyroid does well synthroid doesn't have any t3 in it it's just t4 and the idea is you're, you take it and your body will convert it as needed there are some natural versions of thyroid medication out there. They're called naturally desiccated thyroid or NDTs. And there's a couple different versions of those. Armor is a common one. It's been around for a long time. There's another one called NP thyroid. There was another called nature throid and West throid. Unfortunately, those have sort of fallen to the wayside. But what makes them natural is that they actually come from a pig. And there's one farmer, I think he's in Kansas, and it's thousands of pigs. And when they are harvesting these pigs for food, they save their thyroid hormones and they sell them to these pharmaceutical companies who then dry them out, desiccates them, and then crushes them up and formulates them and standardizes them into thyroid hormone. Well, because it's coming from these animals, you're getting small amounts of T4 and T3 and also T2 and T1, which we don't need to spend any time with. But the point is 
it's a natural form of thyroid, but it's still thyroid hormone. It's still a prescription. You can't get it over the counter. So um, you have to be careful with it, especially because it has that T3 component. In it. Again, that's the active form of thyroid. So that can kind of overdo it for some people. And if you have a propensity for anxiety, or I've seen a lot of cases where they where people will start those and they start to feel really overwhelmed. It's almost too much for their body to handle. So in some cases, Synthroid or Levothyroxine, just T4 is good for people. But if they're not very good converters, if they can't convert that from T4 to T3 very well, and don't feel much better on it, sometimes those NDTs or naturally desiccated thyroids can be helped. The naturally desiccated thyroid hormones uh, can be helpful for people. So those are all prescriptions. In terms of natural forms, again, I mentioned iodine as one example. There are folks who make claims if you take iodine, um, that that can help with your thyroid and its ability to produce hormone. Again, don't want to take too much of that, but it can be, can be helpful in small amounts. And then there are sort of, again, botanical herbal preparations around those that can be a little helpful too. But for people with Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid condition, or just subclinical hypothyroid, or of course, the other side of it, hyperthyroidism, that's a whole different story. Um, unfortunately, a lot of cases, until you can find out why that's happening, sometimes medicine is necessary, uh, but you do need to be monitored pretty closely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for, for answering that. Um, Brittany asks, what blood work needs to be done and how often? Yeah, there's a lot of controversy kind of around this, the, the yearly physical that people talk about, right? And mm -hmm. uh, as we just said a minute ago about heart disease, right? The more information mm -hmm. you can have and sort of understanding if you have a problem or not and what can you do about that. Um, and then on the other hand, it's do you overtest, gather too much information? There's an old saying in medicine, if you come to the office with one problem, you'll leave with 10, right? Like if we keep digging deep mm -hmm. enough, we'll, we'll come up with something and we'll find you know, incidental findings as they find, as they call it. Um, so it's a fine line. And I, I kind of take this on a case by case basis, right? I think it's reasonable to have a, you know, when you establish with a provider to have, uh, obviously get to know the patient and, and have some blood work to get that foundation. And obviously if you find something that's imbalanced, monitoring that and continuing to test for it over time. But if things look pretty good, uh, again, do you need a visit every year to, to continue telling the patient that they're doing well? Sometimes they do. And that can be psychologically or even just comforting in a way like, good, I'm mm -hmm. still doing fine. This is great. And encouraging. I think there's some accountability there. Like, oh, boy, I got to mm -hmm. go in every year and get my blood tested. And boy, I hope everything's still working fine. Um, but the data aren't very clear. You know, it depends on your age. I think if you're in your late teens and early 20s, going to the doctor every year probably isn't as necessary you get into your 50s, 60s, and 70s, probably a little more important to do it regularly to keep an eye out and try to be preventative. Um, but again, I think at the end of the day, it depends on the patient. And that also includes their family history. It sort of depends on, um, you know, sort of the complexity around just what is health. And that includes lifestyle. You know, if the patient is a smoker, if the patient is, um, have problems with, um, you know, getting family history there. So, uh, unfortunately, again, there's not really a simple answer to that, to that good question. Yeah. I will. I'm thinking like cholesterol hormones, like a basic, uh, you know, metabolic, like just a basic profile once a year, I do it for accountability. Cause I want to make sure that I'm doing well, but exactly. I will say, I mean, this is why I, I started coming to you. I remember sitting there talking to a doctor and she said, we don't need to test your hormones. You're not in menopause. And I went to you and we tested it and I'd been in menopause for a while. So it was right. like, I already knew that, but she was telling me I wasn't. And it was like, I almost felt like I had to prove to her and she wouldn't even test me for it. So I took my little Dr. Wozni blood work to her and was like, see, <laughs> like I knew, <laughs> and I'm not saying that to be, but I knew my body was saying something. So I say all of that to say that if you're going through something, like if you're going through this hormonal transition, you'll probably be getting your blood work done more than you would if you're feeling fine, or if you have cardiac issues, maybe it is very, it's probably a really good idea for you to get your cholesterol tested on a regular basis. So I think it's uh, patient specific, right? For sure. For sure. And, yeah. and, and yes. And I think, again, that's where that communication just becomes so important and really just getting to know your patient. So okay. again, if I were to give your listeners any advice is if you're, if your provider, if it's a physician, a physician's assistant, a nurse practitioner, whoever you see, Mm -hmm. Is it listening to you? Then it's time to find somebody new. You're, 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 you, you deserve that energy and that effort to, to be heard. 
And it isn't all about just testing and and I and I get it, unfortunately. The medical community struggles. It's it's overworked and there's a lot of patients and it's challenging. Um, but there are a lot of good providers out there that do really want to help. And uh, if you're not getting heard, then, then definitely keep looking. Excellent advice. Okay. So do you have a, a, a minute for another question? Please. Yeah, please go right ahead. Okay. Yeah. I got a couple of uh, patients. Uh, we, we can keep going. Just a few more. No problem. Okay. So this is an important question. Michelle says, what are some strategies to overcome metabolic resistance? This is a question that I hear a lot. And so I really want to spend some time here because you know, the insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome, those are two terms that are synonymous, correct? Many times, yes. And okay. so the simplest term there is to think about how um, your body controls its blood sugar. And again, I'll try to keep it simple. Um, but it's funny, again, and maybe not a coincidence that I mentioned a minute ago, that the one change that you can make in your life that will have such a profound effect is to limit sugar intake where possible. And mm -hmm. it turns out that metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, all that is typically driven because blood sugar levels are consistently running higher. So full-blown diabetes is blood sugar really high, almost out of control, meaning that the body can't really bring it back down where it needs to be. And metabolic syndrome kind of falls in between that. It's not full-blown diabetes per se, but it means insulin's not working very well. Let's take a step back for a second. Like, what is insulin? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So the way I kind of think about insulin is like a key. And let's say you had to get into your house. So you put the key into the lock and open the door and now you can go inside your house. So insulin is the key and think of yourself maybe as the glucose, the sugar that needs to get into your cells, into your house. Right. What happens with insulin resistance, if you think of a key, it's got those little teeth on it. This is my dad was a locksmith. So this, I kind of think so makes <laughs> me think about this, uh, but it kind of wears down the teeth. So if you put the key in, it doesn't quite turn the lock and the door doesn't open. So you're sort of stuck outside of your house trying to get in, you know, to do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Same thing with insulin. It just, the, the, the receptor, the, the, it's not that the mm -hmm. insulin change, but the, the lock doesn't work as well. So it doesn't fit into the lock and it doesn't open it like it's supposed mm -hmm. to. So this blood sugar stays outside of your cell so that if you prick your finger or measure your blood sugar, it runs high. Okay. So if it can't get into your cells, then it can't do things that it's supposed to, right? So mm -hmm. you don't make energy, you don't do all the all the different biochemical nest, uh, processes. So all this to say, the best thing you can do around that is trying to limit sugar. So in some cases, we'll use you know uh, sugar lowering agent. You know, gymnema is a great, or gymnema sylvestri is a great herb. Chromium is another great one. These are sort of over the counter agents that help balance blood sugar a little bit. But again, at the end of the day, it's really digging into the diet and trying to understand like what what is going on there that may be fueling this um, and leading to more of those problems. And one of the biggest ones there is our triglycerides. So mm -hmm. as the name implies, tri means three, glyceride, sugar. So that if you have excess glucose floating around, extra sugar, it'll store that as a triglyceride, three little sugar molecules with a fatty backbone stack stuck on it and kind of stores it away. So you'll often see, I think that was another question, you know, higher levels of triglyceride in the, the world of sort of elevated blood sugar too. So at the end of the day, again, it's about trying to keep that blood sugar down as much as possible. So say I come to you and I've been overweight for a really long time. I'm postmenopausal. I am addicted to sugar. Is there mm -hmm. hope for me to lose weight? Oh, of course. Yes, of course. Okay. It's, I'm it's, just putting myself in because so many people right now are like, I need to go on Ozempic. I need gastric bypass surgery. Like people are desperate. And so what, what would it. you say to them? It's challenging for sure in the world of, uh, of the food industry in a way. And we don't need to get into that too deeply, mm -hmm. but there are concepts around how food makers have under, they now understand the perfect combination of sugar, salt, and fat, and they call it the bliss point. If you get the perfect amount of that, you tickle the part of the brain that it feels so good to eat that. And mm -hmm. that's, you're, you're fighting that. That's like a, around us constantly and food is readily available really anytime we want. So there's a part of trying to shift the body's desire for that. Like if you've been eating that way for so long, your body gets sort of used to that. It wants that sort of thermostat to be set. And, and to keep that blood sugar somewhat under control and making that shift can be an adjustment, right? 
And sometimes that's where, if you need to, sometimes that's where medicines can be effective and sometimes very, very helpful. But the secret there is to use the least amount for the shortest amount of time to get the maximum effect with the least amount of side effects. Mm -hmm. And that is challenging depending on obviously what you need to do. And it doesn't just mean start starting somebody on Ozempic or metformin or just, you know, okay, here we go. And you're, and oh, you take care, you know, good luck kind of thing. It, mm -hmm. it can be a lot of intervention at first to get people on track, but it is definitely, there is a lot of hope out there, but it's just being able to find uh, uh, someone who's willing to help spend that time with you that you really need. But it is, it's, it, it can be quite challenging, you know, particularly as you said, if it's after menopause, when hormones aren't really helping anymore, and that plays into that, and you may need some support there. So it's it's being very comprehensive as well, and making sure, yeah, making sure you're not missing anything. I'm scared about, like, I was reading something about Ozimbic only because I know a lot of people are using it, and they're not having their blood monitored. Um, and it, I read something where your stomach, like the delaying it's like you're you're slowing down the delay like the way your gi system works right yeah so yeah the, how fast that, things move through the transit time they call it yeah so, that's that's a design of the drug yeah so that sounds terrifying to me because isn't that <laughs> the opposite of what we want like i don't want food sitting in my intestines like that sounds yes. terrifying to me i don't i mean I, i'm being a lay person here i'm just like sure. i know somebody else <laughs> wants to know <laughs> but I mean, we don't have the long-term studies on this. And then also from like a vanity standpoint, and I, I don't even mean to bring that up, but if you Google, because I get this question all the time, what are your thoughts about Ozempic? And I'm thinking if you're going to use it, like, please use it for the right reasons with, like you said, the right doctor, but be doing your part and be monitoring all of it because we don't have the long range. There's no, I don't believe there's any quick fix. I believe you have That's to right. roll up your sleeves and do the work. You have to put yourself to bed. You have to, you know, eat right. You have to exercise. You have to live it. Like that is yep. 90, I feel like 5% of it. Um, but I'm scared to see what's going to happen on the other side of this, because there's this thing called Ozimbic face where people <laughs> literally don't even look the same. Um, and that scares me because I don't want people to think, oh, I can just eat whatever I want and live how I was. And I'll just take this shot or pill and I'll be okay. Um, that scares me because I'm reading about people dying from it. And I, I don't, I, so I'm scared about it for, for people. Cause I don't believe there is a such thing as a quick fix. Yeah. The, I've always said that nothing in nature is free. There's always a consequence and you're, mm -hmm. it, it, however, you're going to try to manipulate something there's has to be a con sometimes it's a small consequence mm -hmm. but in some cases and this may be one of those and it, it could be a big consequence but as you mm -hmm. said we we don't know they did their small studies their their clinical trials through their three mm -hmm. phases for the drug to be approved that's great but that wasn't at the scale it's being used now and, that, and, and what happens the when they get off like that's my question that's i'm right. sorry i wanted to ask you that so what Good how question. do you titrate off of this like how do you go back does like that parasol, like your peristalsis, right? Your GI system, like, does it go good, good right word. back yep, to that's it. working? That's normally? right. So that's where it is. It does need to be tapered, I think, very slowly um, to, to yes, to basically try to help retrain the body. But, you know, back to your point, for those folks who are using it as that quick fix and have not made any adjustment to their lifestyle, I mean, guess what? The, the weight's going to come right back on. And, and mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, it's kind of rebounds. You actually get more weight than when you started. So it's, again, it's not sexy again, and it's not easy. It's where mm -hmm. all that work needs to be done. As you said, it's making those real changes, um, which can be somewhat, you know, somewhere the hardest work that you have to do. And the tools like Ozempic or Gymnema, which again, isn't a great herb for this, um, or, or, or berberine is another real popular one that, that's been going around, you know, another sort of the, the natural Ozempic people have mentioned here. Um, but, but again, that's just sort of a stopgap to the real underlying cause and trying to sort of get to the source of that is, is challenging, but that's where you really do make big differences for people. And I, I want to be really careful to say this, that I'm not saying you shouldn't take it or like, I, I know there are people who have, you know, they're very overweight and they want nothing but to be free of this and they are doing the work. Yeah. And that's the person that's like, yes, you, like, if you have a doctor 
that's helping you and monitoring you and you're using this to, you know, get some weight off or whatever, get gastric bypass surgery or whatever. It's just, I feel like we need to look at it. Like we have to own our part in it too. And, um, because I want to, I want to make sure that I'm not coming across wrong because I know there are people in desperate situations for sure. And I for sure. prayerfully want point. them to get healthy as you know, I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine, like, I know how hard it was for me when I first went through a weight loss transformation, I was so desperate and so sad. And I, I couldn't even do a push up. Like I was so desperate. I was like, how do you, you know, watching my dad suffer, I felt desperate. So I guess I just want to kind of talk to that person who's like, I've tried everything. I'm, you know, 300 pounds. Can I get gastric bypass? Can I do these things? Like, how, what would you say to that person? I will say I actually have those patients. And I, I okay. agree with you. This There are people who, and maybe back to our analogy with the lock and the key not working, mm -hmm. sometimes the, the biochemistry, the physiology has changed so much in the body. Mm -hmm. Patients have been overweight for so long that no matter what steps they take at this point, they're not seeing the change that they need. And these support mechanisms, whether it's ozempic, metformin, you know, medications right. can help recut those keys or make those locks work better because the, along with the underlying foundation that they already have in place, and it's the jump start that they need or the biastric bypass to get them back on their right path. And right. it, and I've kind of always said to patients, you know, there are consequences to things, but there are consequences to things not happening. If you stay right. 300 pounds and all of the, the comorbidities and the other complications mm -hmm. that come with that, that's just as dangerous, maybe even more dangerous than mm -hmm. the risk that can happen with Ozempic and the peristalsis changes. And, and if we're careful with the, dan or the, the doses that we're using and how long we use it, in other words, responsible prescribing, mm -hmm. then there's, that's a great reason to have, and thank goodness we have those kind of medicines and that God gave us all the ability to come up with this kind of right. technology and, and intelligence to do so. So I think it's, um, again, it's on that case by case basis with patients. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess where I'm like you, it's, it's where I'm nervous that are the weight loss clinics that patients have a two minute, five minute visit and are given a prescription Right. I've seen commercials now that people on TV are injecting themselves and it's like, oh boy, I wonder what that means longer term for, for folks. Right. I mean, for me, I'm thinking about my sisters in Christ who love God and they love their families and they just have been in this horrible situation where they've tried all these diets and they want a breakthrough and they, they literally are trying to do the workouts. They're trying to eat, right. They're trying to do everything and they just need hope and they need a push or something. Like, I just want to also let that person know. Um, I believe that God gave people like you and the people that created all of these medicines, the ability to do it. And I think in any situation, people should do what's best for them, but please fight to have your blood tested and be don't just go somewhere and get shots, like make sure someone is monitoring you so that it is a safe journey and that you don't end up dead. Like I, I've, my daughter just said to me the other morning, she's like, mom, this lady died from taking Ozempic. And I was like, what? Because yeah. I know people that have, you know, ended up on that stuff. So I just, I just want to always be fair balance. Like let's do our part. And then if you're in that situation, then do what's right. You know, with you and your doctor, if you've been, if you've prayed about it, then make the decisions you need to make. But the overall message is get healthy. Like this is your life. Like you yeah. don't get another one of these. So yeah. I just think the time is now, like you're worth every good choice. Like skip the things that you know you need, like replace <laughs> all those things that you know are not doing you any good. Um, do you know what I mean? Like I want women totally, to just stand totally. up and say, that's it. I'm fighting for my best health and I'm going to get there. And no judgment, no whatever, like just, but just make sure you have a good 100%. doctor and make sure that you have a good support system and then show Thank up you. for yourself, make those good choices. So for I sure. think that's really important. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say? I, I think we only had one more question about GERD. Someone said, can I just stop <laughs> talking my, can I just stop taking my GERD medication? And then we're done. So I'll let you, if you want to answer that, you can, I know we've spent so much time and I'm just so grateful to you because not everyone has a Dr. Wozni in their life. So thank you. So um, yeah, let me know if there's anything it's, else you wanted to share. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, I, um, the, the, at the end of the day, again, I think 
um, you know, we're all on our, our paths and doing the best we can. And you said it perfectly to have that support system. And in this conversation, the context of this, that, that may mean around a doctor or, or, or just a medical provider. Um, but I think it shows the importance of family and friends and faith and, mm -hmm. and everything in that community that makes you that much healthier and to not overlook those simple um, interventions that, that people do often sort of forget about. And I will say it's that those communities, there are just more and more studies showing this is what helps people live longer. <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. about taking more supplements or, or doing the fad diet. It's about having those connections and those communities um, right. where, where you have true happiness too. So um, encouraging people to, to, to do their best there as, as best they can. Okay. Well, is there anything else you would like to add? Cause we're all done. I think this has been great. It's been lovely chatting with you, of course, and, and always enjoy our time together. And uh, if I can ever help again, please just let me know. Well, thank you, Dr. Wozni. We so appreciate you taking the time to answer all these questions. And I'm sure I'm going to get a lot more questions. So people might be wanting to have you back on the show again. So I just Happy appreciate so. you. I appreciate the doctor that you are and the friend that you are and the treatment that you've given me and my family. We are truly grateful for you. And, and thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor. It's, it's great knowing your whole family as well. And I, I wish you the very best and, and happy to help anytime. I want to thank Dr. Wozni so much for his time. I mean, how good was that? I mean, we can't get that kind of treatment and that kind of friendly doctor. I've had such a hard time finding him and he is pure gold to me. So uh, if you listen to this and you just thought, man, I know so many people would need to hear this, please share it with them because this is information that is going to help you in every stage of your life, right? Thyroid, like all the things we covered, hormones, cardiovascular health. This is a shareable episode for sure. So make sure to share it with your friends. And I am going to say a prayer for us. And then I'm going to close out with some faith fuel. Get a, get a journal, get your Bible. Let's look at these scriptures, write them down. If you, if you can't go over them now, write them down so you can come back to them because Standing on the finished work of the cross is how we move the needle in our lives. Okay. So I'm going to pray. Father God, I lift up every sweet fit sister in Christ who sent in her questions. I pray that they were answered, that she has a sense of peace and that she can now partner with her doctor or whatever she needs to do next so that she can create health and peace and results in her life. Father, I pray over the health of every woman listening to this that you would find that they would partner with you and find the answers that have eluded them. The sleepless nights, the confusion about hormones, the wonderment of, am I going to have this generational curse of cardiovascular disease in my life? Father, in the name of Jesus, no. God, give my sisters peace. Help us walk in your wisdom. Help us know that you're holding our hand with us every step of the way, but remind us that we are powerful. We are not a diagnosis. We are not powerless. We are your daughters. And whatever comes, we can use it for your glory. Father, I, I just am so grateful to you for Dr. Wozni. I'm so grateful to you for my sisters. And I just pray that you would be with us in our health, God. Help us get fit God's way. Help us turn to you and not the worldly answers. Yes, there are answers in the world, but not unless we have been in the word with you, prayed about it, and have peace about it. Can we turn to other things? It has got to be you first, Father. And that is our will today. God, we love you so much. And I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, sister, listen to this faith fuel, okay? Proverbs 4, 6 through 7, New King James Version shares, do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding, okay? Wisdom, don't forsake her. She will pre pre preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. So with all this medical information that we get, it can feel overwhelming. But when you sit with God, you can cut through all of it and just see it as okay, this is what happened. This is what I need to do. Like get prayerful with God. Pray, he will give you 
wisdom. Okay. And that is our next scripture, James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God is holding your answer. Maybe you've been looking all over, you know, Googling everything. What is about this medicine? What about that? Have you sat with God? Have you gotten peace with God? Do that and then go forward. Okay. And then this is so good. Proverbs 3, 13 through 18. Listen to how good God is. Okay. When I was like, Lord, what scripture should I share? I loved this one the most. Okay. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom because let's face it, you guys, our health is taking one wise step after another. It's turning away from things that are robbing us of our health, thoughts that are robbing us of our health, worldly ways. It's There are products and things, yes, we can use in the world, but not until we've made Jesus the centerpiece of our fitness and walked it out in the power of the Holy Spirit that we can have peace and create results, okay? And that is what I want for you. So let me start again. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing, excuse me, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Oh my goodness. Proverbs 3, 13 through 18. I know someone needed to hear that because for me, when I went, you know, Dr. Wozni, I was sitting with him and he was like, okay, Kim, we need to, you know, do your cardiac panel. We need to have you do all these tests. And it wasn't just blood. It was this uh, cardio IQ talked about all the inflammation in my body, um, getting the coronary uh, cardiac, the cardiac calcium score. I was scared. Okay. I'm not going to lie to you. And I was like, nope, I'm choosing faith over fear. I got myself in that car. I drove to those appointments and I literally cried. Like, I am not going to cry right now, but I was like, what? Zero. I had a zero on my cardiac or my coronary, um, my, uh, cardiac calcium score. Sorry. I got emotional there for a second because I understand how scary it can be. And then like Dr. Wozni going through all the hormones and all the, like, I can't sleep at night. I'm miserable. Like walking all of that out, man, it just made all the difference to know that I had the word of God. I had a loving husband. I had an amazing family and friends. I had you guys. Um, and I had a doctor that actually listened to me and wasn't just like, I remember going to one doctor and they were like, just get on this patch. And then when I talked to Dr. Wozni about it, he's like, oh my gosh, that would have literally been like throwing gas on the fire. So having a doctor that listens and cares and looks at all of you is priceless. So I thank God for Dr. Wozni. I thank God for you and for all of your questions. I know this blessed someone. So if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe and share this with someone. Okay. I'm trying to build my YouTube channel. So I greatly appreciate your, your hitting that subscribe button and sharing this and leaving a comment. We could maybe have him back on again. If you have other questions, put them in the comments. Okay. And then also, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please rate and review this podcast because it helps get it with the algorithm in front of women, just like you and me who are like, Ooh, I need this godly goodness, right? We need the word of God in our health. And then lastly, I just want to give you a gift. Okay. Cause I know someone right now might be new to this and they're like, I need to know what God says about my health. So I want to give you 10 scriptures to motivate your fitness goals. And this is something that you can easily refer to. I made it. It's super simple. Like you could literally just like when you get the download, you could take a screenshot on your phone and put it in your, in your album. You could print it off, but I want you to know what the word of God says. So you have that to empower yourself. Okay. So go to Kim Dolanetto.com fitness scriptures, Kim Dolanetto.com forward slash fitness scriptures to download that right now. And don't forget if you want to be on that if you want to be a part of my fit God's way, 30 day transformation, I don't know if I should call it a challenge or a course. Let me know in the comments because a challenge sounds like something that we're going to do for a minute. And this is a lifestyle transformation. This is the lasting answer. So sister, I love you so much. Um, make sure you signed up at kimdolanletto.com forward slash fit God's way waitlist. Get those kimdolanletto.com forward slash fitness scriptures. Cause I want to love on you and I want you to know the word of God and thank you so much for being here.
with so much love. God bless. And remember you are strong, confident, his.